Welcome back to the Crossword Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and today we are joined by uh, Leslin Joseph, uh, the Vice President of Black, Black Lives Matter YYC. LJ, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. No, thank you. Um, I, as I, we said during the pre-interview, I might get some things wrong here today, but I need you to call me out on them because I'm learning. I'm hoping my uh, listeners are learning <clears throat> and I, I want to learn about the city and the organizations that make up this great city. So let's start off with the first question. In your own words, what is Black Lives Matter's YYC? Uh, we're a small organization, literally like five people that are fighting for, I guess, more recognition and respect um, from the broader community uh, for Black people, but not just. We're also for marginalized groups as well. So like the LGBTQ community, um, just marginalized communities in general, really. So when did Black Lives Matter YYC start? Last June. But this has always been in my head for years. So I'm also the co-founder. Okay. So you are the yeah. co-founder as well of this organization. Yeah. Um, why, what, what happened last June that sparked the need for this organization? And I'm just going to go through the history here for a bit before we talk, start talking about policies and politics and all that. But I just want uh, myself and my listeners to know where this organization came from. So what happened in June of 2020 that sparked the outrage? Uh, Not the outrage, but sparked the idea to create the organization. I apologize. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so like I said, it was probably back in... When did I graduate? I graduated in 2018. So I had always been thinking, hey, this, I need to start a nonprofit, but I don't know where to start. And then George Floyd happened and people were looking for somewhere to look to really. And yeah, I just was like, okay, this is the perfect time to do this because if I don't do this now, I don't know when I'm ever gonna do this. Um, so I found Adora and I already knew KL and I I don't even know how I found anybody else in this group. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we all came together. We met at uh, Olympic Plaza on a Sunday and we decided, hey, let's do this. And what was, what did you see as the biggest obstacle that um, your organ, your new organization back in June needed to overcome? Because Black Lives Matter has been around for a few years. It did get more prominent uh, after the, uh, the, the, the murder of George Floyd. I guess I can say that because it is true. He was murdered. Yep. What was the biggest obstacle here in a more conservative uh, city more I, I think we can say progressive but I think we are traditionally a conservative city conservative province yep. what was the biggest obstacle that you would have to overcome uh I mean at first it was kind of like how do you actually start a nonprofit? and then luckily like our admin she's amazing she does everything she wrote our grant well not our grant but like our um our bylaws to submit and that was, that was difficult, but um, I think later it was the momentum of all the interviews that we were getting from like different stations and like radio stations, TV stations, and then them airing and not being used to that. And then having people freak out about what you're saying and people being offended by just us saying Black Lives Matter, which was really ridiculous. Like, I don't know if you heard about what happened in Red Deer with Taylor McNally and I, what I, out there. It was wild. So from what I understand, and this is just my, and yet again, my mind is not the best right now. I'm going through some treatments and I just want to make sure that I'm doing this correctly. And if I'm, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But um, 
there was a rally for Black Lives Matter in Red Deer, and there were some uh, not polite words uh, hurled at the people at the rally. Or is there more into it? Because again, I'm learning and I just, I need to know. So if, if I'm completely up creek without a paddle, please correct me right now. So, okay. Taylor and like Inclusive Canada, which used to be called Red, Rural Alberta Against Racism. Uh, we were actually, it wasn't even a rally. We just went out there to go like chat with other local Albertan groups that are like-minded. And because we post that we were going to meet a counter group showed up and there had already been tensions with this group and like parts of our group. Cause like, like I said, like Taylor and her group is not actually part of BLM. Um, YYC. And um, it just got crazy. It got so out of control, but we showed up and we were so outnumbered. It was we didn't expect that we were like why are these people here and then me being who i am i'm not like really confrontational at all but the question i usually ask any counter protester that comes to us is why are you here and they couldn't really give us an answer and they were just offended that we kept saying black lives matter and they're <laughs> and people still are like that and i it's really funny but also really disheartening. I, I want to ask the the, 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 of course, follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised? Were you surprised that there was a counter protest? Because again, we live in a conservative province and I, I don't want to say that is a bad thing. We did elect an NDP government. So we do have hope on the horizon, but rural Alberta does traditionally vote a certain way and they are, they don't like change. So were yeah. you surprised or were you sort of, okay, I know it's going to happen. I know there's going to be a counter protest no matter where we go. Or were you actually surprised? I personally was kind of shocked because like this was the first time I'd left the city for anything for this. Um, Taylor expected it because she's been through this more than once. She was serving papers to somebody because they were harassing her. Oh, wow. So that's actually how this whole thing started. Um, but it, it's a group of people that still come to our protests to counter protests. Like on Sunday, one of them was still there. He comes to every single one of them. They follow us around. It's kind of weird. They're obsessed. <laughs> so I, I, I've not had a, the pleasure or honor to sit down with anyone on the opposing side. And I don't think I ever will, to be <laughs> honest. But I, I, from your perspective... Why do you think they are upset with the words Black Lives Matter? Because it seems like something that everyone should agree on. In exactly. my opinion, everyone should be able to say those three words, Black Lives Matter. But when I see people protesting Black Lives Matter, I go, why? And mm -hmm. then their rebut is, well, all lives matter. Yes. So what is your response to that? Because I, and this is where I'm going to probably get into some, some shit and I'm probably going to put my foot in my mouth a few times. So I do apologize right now, but what is your response? What is the Black Lives Matter YYC response to, well, all lives matter? It's the bare minimum. It's our lives matter and it's not more, it's not less, it's as well equal to it it's the hardest thing for me to answer because the person that i am i hate i hate confrontation so i usually don't actually want to engage with anyone that asks me like why are you saying this and i went to a long-term care home during the campaign and i said like i'm part of elmyyc and she was like but all lives matter. And then <laughs> another lady in the group was like, okay, but they're not saying that they're better than everybody else. We just want to be treated the same because statistically we are killed more 
by the police, we are treated less than for most part. Um, and our core group, most of us are like darker. So there's colorism as well. So like the darker you are, it's almost like the worst off things are, you're treated. It's, it's actually really upsetting. Um, it's, yeah, I, I just hate I, having to like argue with anyone on it. I have to ask the question because again, I am, I, I was told not to say this, but I'm gonna, I, I have to say it, but I, I, I've never been in your shoes. I, uh, I can, I, I am, I have a place of privilege and I need to be checked from time to time when people, my husband, co and I'm in an interracial marriage and my husband says all the time that police don't look at him now because he has a white person in the car. And I've never understood the whole concept of being marginalized because I've never felt it. So I have to ask this question and I, and I know I've probably just put my foot in the mouth. And I, like I said at the beginning of this, I do apologize for that. But how have you been marginalized? What, what have you felt growing up as a Black woman in the city of Calgary? It's been weird because you don't notice until like you're kind of afraid. Like I didn't realize when I was a kid that I was the only black kid. And then I started kind of realizing, I was like, holy crap, there's literally like three of us in school. And I lived in the Northeast my entire life. So that's really weird. Um, you get followed a lot. Even my mom gets followed. She goes to the grocery store and she gets followed. She's like 70. So I, I can't even understand that. Um, I feel personally as though I've been lucky. I have, at, I have had encounters with police, but each time I've gotten completely away with it. And I, I don't understand, like I almost feel guilty which is like the craziest part of it because I should feel happy that I haven't been arrested. I, it's not like I've kept myself out of trouble this whole time. So <laughs> um, you feel uneasy too. Like I will go to events and I will literally count how many other black people are here. Like my friends are Asian too. So we always play this kind of game, like how many, <laughs> minorities are in the room um i i've applied at jobs and i've never gotten a call back i've changed my name multiple times on my resume and i i think just in general my name just comes off either too ethnic or my background because right now it has like blm on it it just it's a red flag. I, yeah, it's been weird. I don't think my experience is completely different from others. I feel. Well, and not to put words in your mouth, but we had a conversation on our, on my front step and you, you we, we, and this, where this conversation came, stem, stem from, but even within the organization, there are different opinions on how the organization should run. And you are one voice. And I should, I should iterate to my listeners, uh, LJ is one voice here. She yep. is one voice in an organization that is trying to do good for our city. I want to talk about how something you just said and something you just iterated to that you've, you've been followed. Your mother has been followed in the grocery store. And I, I don't want you to assume why you've been followed, but I wanna ask the question, have you felt like you have been targeted in this city because of your skin color? That's a hard question. Cause like I said, like I feel like almost guilty that I've never been like viciously attacked besides in like the comment section <laughs> of anything um 
Do you think the city is a racist city? If you don't want to answer that question, I completely understand that. It's I a just, hard question to answer, actually. But I feel like people need to realize their privilege, at least. And after going to the protests on Sunday and having time to speak, realizing that even though I'm almost a neutral voice when it comes to BLM, because I know at some point, I'll probably still continue with politics. So I have to tiptoe a little. Um, so people it's, aren't happy. <laughs> so just to, just to clarify here, for those who are listening, this is coming out in November. Um, LJ just mentioned the protest and I'm assuming the protest you just mentioned was the Sean Chu resign. Okay. I just wanted yeah. to make sure that my uh, listeners knew that. So that way they going, what, what, what protest happened on uh, Halloween? So <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that people knew that. Um, let's talk about Black Lives Matter. YYC. What is the goal of the organization? We have a few boxes to check. So first is defund the police. That is like, that's we'll talk, our... Okay, we'll talk about that one here soon. <laughs> what are the other yeah. ones? What are the other boxes? Uh, Adora is like a, an amazing public speaker. So she goes out, she's our resource person, really. She like is a walking resource for anti-racism. So that's like our big thing, really. That's our overarching umbrella to teach anti-racism to people, but without doing too much work, because we're always doing so much work as Black people to educate others, and it gets kind of annoying and monotonous. So... I'm sorry? No, it's okay. Okay. I was <laughs> like, I now I feel terrible that I've asked no. you to educate me on this organization, so if, if no, this no. is bad, I apologize. Nope. Okay. I sometimes, like I said, like it's necessary, but to have someone be like, how can I not be racist? It's like, okay, there's Google for that. There's resources like go to our site. <laughs> so let's talk about box one that you mentioned, defund the police. What would that accomplish in your mind I'm talking to the vice president, LJ, not the organization right now, but the vice president, or I'm just talking to LJ right now. What would defund the police look like in LJ's eyes? It would mean like communities in Ward 10, Ward 5, 9, I think I listed 13 as well on there that are underserved would be better served with the money that is taken out of CPS. Um, they make, they get like almost half a billion dollars every year and it goes unchecked. So even with like defund, it would, it would make checks and balances. Like you can't just submit a budget and it get okayed because that, I don't think that's good for the city anyways. If you're trying to say that you're fiscally responsible, it's not fiscally responsible to keep throwing that much money at an organization, which now we're seeing has so many issues. And it's, oh, I could get into like the whole Sean Chu thing. But, well, and that's what I just, I was going to ask the follow-up question to that. And I apologize for interrupting, but. no. Nope. With, so if, for those who are listening outside of Calgary, our current incumbent Ward 4 counselor, um, during the last uh, 2021 election, uh, within days of the election, uh, news reports came out saying that uh, a, while he was a member of the Calgary Police Service, he assaulted a 16-year-old girl. She went through the court system for a long time to try to get justice for what happened. Sean Chu, the counselor, during the campaign, came out and said, yes, this happened. 
I, and then later after he was, he won, it was announced that he had taken this 16 year old girl back to his house and there was a gun involved. An off duty police officer had taken a 16 year old girl. He has openly admitted this back to his residence. He has said, and I'm just making sure I say this so that way he can't come back and sue me. He has said he did not know she was 16 years old. Uh-oh. From your organization's perspective, so there is an investigation going on by CPS right now of how this happened, what steps needs to be done to fix this uh, situation. The joke that I still can't believe came out that, uh, as I think it was either yesterday or today was, we're still looking for the records because they haven't been digitized from the Calgary Police Service on this issue. It actually came out today where the police chief said, we, can't, we are looking for the records, we're looking for the uh, reports. They haven't been digitized, so we have to go through boxes. Oh God. So when you hear reports like this, that, a police officer, a position of power, assaulted a 16 year old girl. From your perspective, what does that tell you about the police service? There's so many things wrong with it. Um, Like ACER was created, I believe in 2009. So that was just after this happened. they're essentially cops checking into other cops, which should not happen. Like, you can't self-govern yourself, especially if you're a police officer. And I was going through that website just yesterday. They've charged, they've laid charges for 44 officers and probably less than five of those had like any time to be served, which is horrible because like all of these charges range from like sexual assault, assault, uh, careless driving, causing death, fraud, theft. And if I did that, I'd go to jail. We've seen Alex Dunn like slam a black woman to the ground. Later, she, she dies the same day he gets, I think it was like nine months house arrest or it was like altogether, it was like nine months worth of like a slap on the wrist. Why no jail time? Like there's no accountability. There's no transparency because I had to search for that site. It wasn't easy to find. None of the things are easy to find. And if you want to like hold the commission accountable for all of this stuff you have to like know when their like public hearings are they're awkward times they're like three o'clock in the afternoon so for us we like attend almost every single one of these meetings we go to city council meetings as well like we're actively involved and watching to see what any fallout is going to be for really any issue that they're having. So right now we're actually watching to see for the next one, see if Sean Chu comes up and hopefully he does. Um, I want to talk about that citizen oversight because there is a police commission that is appointed by the city council of the day. So uh, the new, I think uh, the, the, I think they were appointed last term. So I think they still got another term left, but yeah, it is a, it is a police commission, uh, made up of citizens of Calgary, but also counselors, also a few other organizations. Mm -hmm. What would you want them to do tomorrow to help your organization out? And let's start with the police commissions first. They need a complete overhaul. Like they're, they're, um, the way they choose them is really weird because I applied. All of us applied. All of us in BLM applied. Even like Taylor applied. <laughs> they didn't take any of us. 
because they know that we want a lot of changes. Um, like I said, the budget is one of them, especially for me. Um, we wanted race-based data. They've actually looked into that, which was kind of nice to see. Um, what was the other thing? Yeah, we just, we want less militarization as well. So all of these things really do come down to budget though, because all of these things fall within there. Um, but yeah, we just, we want to be invited to the table and they're not inviting us. They keep shutting us down every single time. So I, I want to ask the question, uh, and I'm asking this to the vice president, LJ here. Um, what does defund the police actually, what, what is the step? Because when I hear defund the police, and when I think everyone hears defund the police, they hear different numbers, whether it be 50%, whether it be 80%, whether it be 10%, whether it be 2%, whether it be 100% and just abolish the uh, police service. What is the, because you have to have a number. It, no matter where you go, you have to have a number. You say, okay, we need to take this much money out of the police budget and put it towards X, Y, and Z. And before we get to what uh, Black Lives Matter YYC wants to do with X, Y, and Z dollars, what is the number in your mind? For me, when I wrote the first petition, it was 15%. And why and that number? Why I picked 15 was because at first I could not find where 15% of their budget was going to. Again, that was really hard to find the breakdown. Um, it actually turned out that when we got together as a larger group, we found the stat that 30% of the calls for CPS were actually mental health calls. And we were like, okay, I know 30% is quite ambitious, but these are the calls that we don't want them taking because these are calls that they generally fuck up. So, so would, where, would that, where would that money go? Would you want it to be put into sort of AHS or would you want a separate entity within CPS to just look after mental health call? I just need to, I just, I'm just trying to confirm what, what where this is going, because uh, I, I know you, if you say 15%, the, that's the number you want uh, removed from the police budget. Where, where would it go? Would it go back into another organization? Would it go back into AHS? What would you be looking at? We wanted it to go to groups like Street Cats, uh, even like Pink Flamingo, because they deal with the LGBTQ community, um, Bear Clan Patrol, uh, just all these little groups that never get funding. Because like I was saying earlier, to get funding and grants, it's like, you, you have to jump through a lot of hoops. And we saw what happened with, um, so the end result actually was that they took 5% and that 5% that they actually ended up taking from the, like the city coffers instead of CPS when CPS was like, let's defund ourselves. Um, they put it back into like grandfathered organizations. Like, I think it was like cups and like all the old ones that everyone knows. And we were like, that's not what we asked for. That's the groups you guys already work with. It's great that they get money, but they already have this money. They're have you met with the police service? Like, have has Black Lives Matter YYC actually had a sit down meeting with the chief of police in the city of Calgary? Taylor has multiple times. We have, have I chatted with him? I chatted with a few police officers and it's weird. The relationship is so bizarre because they're like, you should apply for the commission. You should apply for all these positions. I'm like, but I've done that. <laughs> so I don't understand what you're telling me to do. Um, just because they know I'm not going to get invited to that table. They know, but yeah, we definitely have. We're, we're not just like doing this and not talking to anybody. Like we talked to counselors. We talked to, we've even went to like Casey Madu. He had, uh, he sent us an invite to 
one of his events just like a few months ago. We went. During Stampede, probably. I think it was, was it during Stampede? I can't remember the exact date because I didn't go. I was at work, but like Adora and one of our other members went and it was ridiculous. We just, we can't take him seriously because he also has personal stuff. Like it's weird, like him, Sean Chu, Farkas, they all had something personal to say about BLM specifically. Yeah. So kind of it just rubs you the wrong way. It's hard to like maintain a relationship with someone that's going to like, who, who's in power also be like that. So we have a new council. Uh, we have a new mayor. Um, do you have hope that there could be change? Like, have you, has your organization requested a meeting with uh, Mayor Gondek yet? Or are you going to be doing that in the days to come? We will. I just reposted our petition, our original one, um, which has like over 6,000 signatures so far. Oh, wow. So, and I know Courtney. So... Courtney Walcott, Ward 8. Yeah, counselor. Courtney Walcott, yes. Not not Courtney Bradigan or yeah. Courtney Penner. Oh, <laughs> Courtney Penner, yes. She did change her name. Um I'm trying to keep so, them all straight right now. It's, hard. Yeah. it's all learned not experience. So we're hoping Courtney will be kind of our inside. But I've also talked to Gondek, so like before this, before I started even campaigning. So we're hoping that something can come of this, but I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I'm hopeful. So for those who have been listening, uh, LJ has mentioned campaigning a few times. Uh, for those who don't know, who are listening outside of the city of Calgary, LJ ran in the last municipal election in Ward 10. Um, so I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that. Um, Looking to get your message out? Looking to get your product heard about? Have an upcoming event in the province of Alberta. For as low as $50 per week, you can now advertise on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Reach out today by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca and click on Advertise Now. If you book your advertisement during the month of December, you will get 50% off. Now, let's get back to the episode. Let's talk about anti-racism here for a second. Mm -hmm. During the campaign, I had someone come on the show, like the show, and say the words to me, I don't see colors. Mm. When you hear something like that, as the vice president of Black Lives Matter, what does that send to you? Because I, I've, I've asked a few people, they've all given me different answers, and I want to know from your perspective, what does that say to you? And this person was white. This person uh, does not see colors, as she said. What does that say to you? It's weird because we're not all the same. Like, uh, it's like you don't acknowledge our existence our struggles just you it's like you don't even want to understand what we go through because uh, i've had friends jokingly say that to me and i'm like that's ridiculous like i'm clearly completely different from you our experiences are never going to be the same so to say that you don't see color is to be like, okay, so if you were followed by the cops and then said beaten by the same cops and you don't see my color, it just, it feels really weird to like just brush it off and be like, okay, well, they just beat up another person. Like, yeah, you don't want to be statistic, but it is actually a statistic. <laughs> It, it is. And I, uh, again, I am not in, I'm in, uh, I've never been in your shoes. I've never been in a lot of people's shoes. I've only been in my shoes. So I cannot stand up and say I can relate because I, I can't, because I just, I've never 
felt what you have felt. And I, I feel um, stupid for saying this, but I don't know how, how I, as Chris Brown, not the rapper, can help you. <laughs> How 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 can how can I help move this city forward? Help move this province and country and this world forward to not have a racist society where people have to feel like they're being watched, where we are now looking at statistics where BIPOC people are being targeted for being BIPOC. <sighs> Um, and then that, this goes back to your question of, I don't want, you're going to tell me there's Google. So go look for Google. But I, I, I just, if you could tell, if you could talk to the people of Calgary right now, the people who have had privilege all their lives, what would you tell them right now to hopefully change their mind in thinking that while black lives matter, we need to take it serious that black lives actually do matter. If you want to help yourself, you have to help those that are being overlooked. It's kind of like, if you look at the city as a whole and you don't look at the people and you just look at the areas, like say Ward 10, Ward 5, Ward 9, kind of overlooked. I mean, Ward 9 is getting a lot better, but it's kind of like that. So there's like all those nice, rich neighborhoods. They don't really need that much help. But say there's Ward 10 who's been like completely overlooked. If you help Ward 10, you're going to better the rest of the city. And honestly, that's what I campaigned on anyways, because it's the exact same model as being anti-racist. You help those and I don't even want to say below because that's ridiculous and that sounds really bad. But the, like I said, the ones that are been overlooked consistently, you help them out, you help everybody out. It, it's really honestly that simple. No, and, and I appreciate that because it does seem that simple that you help people, you elevate people and you talk to people who are being overlooked on a regular basis and you just i'm assuming don't don't look away when something's happening that you need to call yeah. out yeah like it's super uncomfortable like even i get super uncomfortable calling people out i typically i try not to judge people i try to kind of remember everyone's human and like no one's going to be perfect and i i hope in my brain every single time i talk to someone i'm like please don't just believe they're racist just think the best but it's not even about equality it's about equity because if you all start at the same point it's like if you're running a race and like if we're running a race you're probably gonna beat me starting at the starting line but um, i have bad knees so if it comes to racing i'm gonna collapse right at the starting gate i'm probably gonna like have a heart attack probably so you're you're gonna be far out in advance of me there, lj let's just be honest there i have horrible knees though too so see we're starting with both bad knees yeah but you're probably gonna take me though uh... Like in theory, like say we didn't both have bad knees. Okay. I, I you being a white male, you have like a head start. Well, and that's which I know it sucks to hear that, but like No, it does because the fact that you've had to change your name on your resume to apply for jobs bothered me. And yeah. I I it, it it I shouldn't say it pisses me off because it really it infuriates me that we have a society that judges people on just their name. They don't know what you look like. They don't know who you are, but we have people in the society who will judge you based on your name. And that bothers me. 
And that pisses me off to no extreme. So when people tell me that, well, all lives matter, no, I'm sorry. Like say the three words, as I said at the beginning, black lives matter. And when you are being targeted, when BIPOC people are being targeted on a regular basis in our city, we need to do better. And I wasn't going to mention this because this has no, this, no, I'm not going to because it's not my story to tell. So I'm just going to leave it there. I, I hope it gets better. I know the old adage, it gets better, but we haven't seen it get better. So no, we're stuck in a weird cycle where like you think you're moving ahead. Like one day you're like, Oh, that was an awesome day. And then the next day you're like, seriously, are you, are you kidding? Like again, like on Sunday, the Sean Chu protest, like after speaking, everyone's like, yeah, that was great. And then like, uh, like, I swear to God, less than 24 hours later, everyone's like, that was uncalled for. Well, okay. So <laughs> I need to, I need to clarify something because you posted something on Twitter about that. What happened? Because there was a protest and an anti-protest, like the supporters of Sean Chu and the uh, people who wanted him to resign were mm-hmm. on both sides of Memorial or whatever street it is. I, I still, I, I know Whitehorn. That's, that's, that's <laughs> my, that's my knowledge of Calgary. Okay. Whitehorn and the Tom Baker Cancer Center. If oh. it's not those two places, I don't know where it is in the city. But what happened during that? Because from what I understand, a car was burnt. Or was an accusation of a car being burnt? I saw that video. I have no idea when that took place. Okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because I thought that's what your comment was about. It's like, okay, what's going on here? So what, what was your comment about, about we both, we sort of, we need to, I I don't want to put words in your mouth. So what you said something on Twitter and I just want you to uh, elaborate on it. I say a lot on Twitter. Um, So after the protest, I honestly, I've been going to sleep at like eight. So I missed everything after that. And I've been kind of like on a social media diet. Um, but it was in order of speaking, Taylor went first, Adora went second, and I went last. And in terms of like energy, that's pretty accurate. So Taylor called out everyone for exactly what she should have being performative like you can't just show up because Sean Chu's a counselor that's the tip of the iceberg he was a cop he did two three things technically that were horrible nothing happened all three of us made those points and everyone was like well this isn't about BLM this is about Sean Chu and him assaulting a 16 year old and we're like "Mm, again bigger picture and we just want people to show up when we have protests like we were out there for 15 days and nobody came out until Taylor was attacked so we're frustrated and rightfully so and I'm pretty sure it was the organizers because Taylor's been blocked now from that Twitter account that organized the protest and I was like, I don't understand. <laughs> we said what needed to be said. So why is everyone so upset? <laughs> and everyone has the right to say what they want to say at the end of the day. And that's what bothers me is we have organizations within the city who want to silence some organizations because they might say the wrong thing, but they'll invite mm-hmm. you to speak, but <laughs> only your script that is approved by them. I, I, I wish we we lived in a kumbaya world where everyone got along, but it's never going to happen. No. Um, I want to ask you a poignant question right now. And this might piss me off when I ask it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. We live in a 24 hour news cycle. We have Mm. actually, I should, I should correct that. We live in a 15 minute news cycle. Yeah. Things happen on a regular basis. We had the discovery of residential schools, uh, graveyards. When was that? In February, it, it, earlier this year, in May, if I'm not mistaken. It was, it was in 2021. Yes. We, 
we lowered the flags. We 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 mourned. News after news of other schools started coming out. Mm-hmm. We became oblivious to it. We don't seem to talk about it as much as we have done in the past. George Floyd last year murdered on the streets of Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. We have people of color, BIPOC people in the city who face those challenges every day, but yet people just don't care. Has, it, has our media- don't care until it affects them. It, okay, correct. I apologize. Yes, they don't care until it affects them. But even when it affects them, okay, it'll affect me for a day, two days, and then I'll move on. How That's why we- Sean Chu thinks it's going to blow over. It, I'm going to say this, and this has gotten me into trouble when I've said this to a few people. We have a federal member of parliament who is in the exact same position as Sean Chu. It was discovered while he was in the military, he assaulted, he sexually assaulted somebody. He is now an independent MP for the riding of Trinity, uh, Trinity uh, Spadina, Fort York. I have his button up there, so that's the only reason I know <laughs> It was a big thing for about a week after the election. Where's the outrage now? Exactly. This how happens. Do, all how the do we time. change that though? How do we change that so people actually actually care for longer than 15 minutes? You know what? It's actually funny because like when I even look at my own Twitter during my campaign, it was ridiculous. Like, I get notification after notification after notification. Now that the election's done, I say something, it's like crickets, and I'm like, okay, here we go again. Now I got to be really loud and really obnoxious, and I hate doing that because I'm an introvert. So, yeah. No, I totally hear you. It, it's weird because <laughs> I was literally just thinking the same thing. I was like, now how do I get people to, like, pay attention to what I'm saying? Yeah. And I don't right. know how. Do, do we have to constantly run in elections? Like, Jason Kenny, if you're listening to this, extend the election period to the day after the election is called. So that <laughs> way we can then officially start the next campaign. So that way people can actually pay attention to the issues that matter. Because it seems like elections come or go, and those are when the issues are raised. And then after the elections, it's like, okay, we can all go back to our happy-go-lucky lives that we all don't live in right now. Yeah, no, that seems about right. Because... <laughs> Like, how many elections? I feel like we've had too many in, like, the last, like, just so much stuff has happened in the last, like, 24 months. It's hard to keep track of everything. And with the pandemic on top of it, that's not helping. Yes. I really, like, and it's weird. In the winter, you can't really protest. You can. If you're dedicated, you will. But I don't know. Like, even our protesting, no one shows up, so. And everything's online. I I don't even know. I'm trying to figure out, like, how how do we get people to care? Well, you probably don't need to hear this. I don't need to blow smoke up your ass, and let's be honest, I'm probably not going to hear, but I care. I care that our society is broken. I care that we have people in this society who don't feel safe that need to change their name on their resume. And I'm just, I use that because I'm still flabbergasted at that flabbergasted because I've I never heard that a lot of names I've and ne- we all do this. Yeah. I am. I am sad that our, I am pissed off and angry that our society is broken where we, we have, classes of citizens now and we're all not equal because we should be and until that moment when we're all equal i will continue to say black lives matter i will have to say socially distanced because you know the whole cancer but i want to leave on a a semi good note instead of me being angry i want to talk about a new company that has been well i shouldn't say new company um LJ's new endeavor into the clothing industry, the fashion and fashion industry. Yep. <laughs> Hoot and Blow. Let's let's talk about Hoot and Blow for a second, LJ. What is it all about? Well, it is cannabis and tattoo inspired inspired apparel. 
um, I enlisted a few of my tattoo artist friends and some local artists to like draw a bunch of owls that are high and I throw them on t-shirts and hoodies. And, uh, okay. Them. Hello. I <laughs> yep. literally just got that. You said owls <laughs> like what? And then it took me two seconds. Oh, yeah. So how, how did this idea come about? I was smoking weed. <laughs> it's legal. God bless it. Yep. Um, so how can people like be some, I'm assuming you, you're wearing a t-shirt A zoom is not the best, but t-shirt or sweater. T-shirt. T-shirt. So how can people look up the merchandise to potentially buy some stuff? Because I'll link it in the show notes. I have an actual, like, I tore down my campaign site the day of. And I rebranded as ljjoseph.com. And on there, you can literally find anything. It's pretty much a one-stop shop for LJ. (laughs) LJJoseph, all one word? Yep. ljjoseph.com. To my listeners, go to the show notes. You know what to do. Click on that. Go check it out. Hoot and blow. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm still laughing about it. It took me a few <laughs> seconds to get to it. It usually does. <laughs> um, LJ, thank you so much for this. I've uh, I, I, I've scratched the surface, but uh, next protest, if I will try to be there because until social distancing and I can actually go further than 10 minutes from my house without having a brain cloud. I will be there. Awesome. Um, everyone, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. This is the cross Border interview podcast. We will be back tomorrow with a uh, Canadian country music star, Lori LeBlanc from New Brunswick. Uh, LJ, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>